In the summer of 2006, in the span of just a few short weeks, Olivia and I got married, moved into our first house, both started new jobs, and then quickly became, ended up with two pets. Kara, uh, this is Kara, our cat, very curious. Uh, she is named after the Greek word for joy. And we got Kara as a small kitten. She no longer is quite that small. And then Buttons. We were given Buttons, the Shih Tzu, as um, the couple who had her before us were going back on the road doing some long haul trucking and they couldn't take their pets with them. And so we ended up with, with Buttons, named as such because when she first showed up on her, the owner's step, she was as cute as a button. It was, now it's been many, many years later now, and on April 5th of this year, Buttons died of congestive heart failure. And this is the first time that a pet has died that was really my pet. Growing up, we'd had pets. We'd had Wilbur the Beagle for a very short period of time. My brother and I managed to ignore that dog completely, and my parents did the wise thing and found a better home for it. Then we had Bubba the Demon Cat. Let's just say she lived up to her name, and when she was no more, it didn't bother me much. We had some birds, but I don't think birds count. Maybe I'll like birds, but ugh. So I never really had my pet that had died, and it struck me unexpectedly hard. And as I was holding buttons on what turned out to be her last day, I called a good friend of mine who has had dogs who have died, and had some small animals, or small children and small animals at the same time. And I needed to seek some advice. How do you handle this? How do you talk to a small child when the dog goes away? And uh, that's what I called to ask about, but it turned out that's not what I really needed to talk about. What I really needed to talk about was whether I had done right by buttons. Yeah, I started telling uh, my friend, you know, we've been to the small animal hospital over in Kirksville. This is the third time that week and x-rays and, and drugs. By the end, buttons was on Lasix, an anti-seizure medication, a heart medication, a pain medication, a bone supplement, and uh, she was not liking all those pills, but she was on all of them. And we were talking about, I was explaining all the things we were doing for uh, Buttons. And my friend jumped in and said, Andy, you know, you've done everything that person could ask. And you're fine. You don't need to worry about that. And that kind of ended the conversation. And then later that day, Buttons, Buttons died. And I, I, I found myself thinking about that over the next coming days. And I called my friend a few days later and I said, you know... I think I, I need to, we need to chew on this some more because I'm not sure about this. And I had to tell him, you know, uh, Olivia's been doing this show down in, in Macon, Les Mis, and so we, she's been gone a lot and I've been busy and I'm not sure we've been spending enough time with Buttons recently. And um, I've been struggling not to be annoyed with, with Buttons because as she's gotten older, her bladder has gotten older too. And, and do you wake me up to get walk the dog once in the middle of the night? Okay. Twice? About the third time a dog wakes me up to get me up to go out walk about four in the morning, I'm, I'm, I, I was struggling to be gracious, let us just say. I was struggling not to get really snappy and, and short. Cause I, and, and I needed my friend to listen to me as I kind of struggled with, am I right with my dog? And that might sound like a small thing, but matters to me. need to make sure I'm right with my dog. Did I, did I have something I needed to confess the next time we gathered to worship, or was I okay? And uh, talked to my friend, and, and we, we worked through it, and in the end, we could come to this agreement that, you know, the timing was bad. We really wish we'd had more time with her, that the show hadn't just happened, but we, we, we were square with our dog, and, uh, and I appreciate my friend giving me the time to work through that. Because sometimes you call a friend, you work through something, you get something off your chest. Sometimes that's not the answer. Sometimes you don't come to the end and you're okay. Sometimes you get to the end of that discussion and you're not okay. And the, the result is, Andy, you've done messed up. You've got to go apologize. And, and that's been the result often as any. But this time, okay, we're fine. That, and that, that mattered to me. But thinking about this, it got me thinking about how sin and forgiveness works because how do we react when someone we love comes to us and wants to talk about how they've messed up? What's our first response usually? Oh, I'm sure you're fine. It must be that other person's fault, right? We are very quick to love the person we love 
and, and not and blame someone else. It, it's not. It, it's easy to talk about someone else's sin, those people we don't know. But when it comes to our friends and family, if someone comes to us that we love, it is hard for us to hear that they might have messed up. It's uncomfortable to talk about such such things, grief, failures, uh, sin, death. We don't want to talk about these things, and we, we want to just make it right. Say, you know, I'm sure you're fine. I'm sure you did okay. Just, just relax. And yet when we do that, it, it doesn't really get us anywhere. It, but it's the same thing we see in the lives of the disciples. It's, it's, not, it's not anything new. If you read the disciples and how they respond to Jesus, when Jesus starts talking about suffering, what do they say? Oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. When Jesus starts talking about uh, how he, he's going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and he needs them to pray with him because of what's coming, what do they do? Take a nap. And then when the trial happens and he needs the disciples to be there with him, where are they? Well, they're not there. The disciples, just as much as any, just as much as we, we don't want to be there for the uncomfortable discussions, for the hard moments, even when it's talking about people we love. And I don't think I realized how much this is true, how much we want to avoid that, till I found, found myself needing myself to work through something. Was I right with my dog? You know, I, need, I needed someone not to pretend that everything was okay, but someone to take it seriously that I might have screwed up. It is uh, Richard Niebuhr who, there's a guy, Richard Niebuhr, a theologian of the 20th century, he, he writes of this temptation, and what he writes is that what, we are tempted to worship a God without wrath, who brings men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a, cro of a Christ without a cross. We, we want to have God and, and, and kingdom and Christ, but we don't want to have that sin or judgment or cross part. But when we look at Jesus, we see that that's what he focuses on, right? He does not gloss over that we have sinned, that he takes our sin and our brokenness seriously. He does not, on Good Friday, Jesus does not look around and say, okay, y'all are forgiven. What's for lunch? I mean, Jesus is not going to, that's not how it works, right? Jesus doesn't say, okay, everyone ever, you are all forgiven. Let's go have some fried chicken. That's not what happens. Jesus is crucified as a result of our sin, as a consequence of our brokenness, and, and he experiences the real pain and suffering that comes from our sin. He is crucified and he is rejected. And when he is rejected, that is when he forgives. He forgives taking our sin seriously. It is when this truth is told, when we accept that we are sinners and then are forgiven, that's when lives start to change. And if you want an example of this, there is no better example than Peter, the leader of the disciples, right? Peter is always the first one to get involved. He's always the first one to take charge. He's always the first one to stick his foot in his mouth. I identify with Peter. And uh, what does Peter do? He says to Jesus, I will be there no matter what, right? I'm right there by your side. And then the trial happens, and G he denies Jesus once. He denies Jesus twice. He denies Jesus a third time. And then the cock crows, and Jesus goes through his trial alone. Okay, Jesus is crucified. He, he, he dies. He is buried. He is resurrected. He comes back. They're sitting on the beach, having some roasted fish together, right? They're back together. And what happens next? between Jesus and Peter. Does Jesus say, you know what, it's all good, don't worry about it? No, Jesus goes up to Peter and he says, the first time he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Then he says it a second time, he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Then he goes up and he says it a third time, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now, does he say it three times because Peter's hard of hearing? Does he say it three times because Peter's forgetful? No. He says it three times because Peter denied Jesus three times. He failed three times. He sinned three times. And here it is. He's, Jesus is not pretending it didn't happen. Now, he has denied Jesus three times, and now he is going to confess and commit three times. I will love you. I will feed my sheep. This is when Peter's life is redeemed. He goes from being the failed disciple to the forgiven leader. And he becomes the first bishop of the church. He leads the church that practices forgiving people just as Peter has been forgiven. Taking sin seriously and saying, even though you have sinned, and we both know that, 
you are forgiven. You are welcomed and forgiven. That is at the heart of what we are celebrating today. That Jesus takes our sins seriously. He knows that you and I are both sinners. We have sinned by what we have done and left undone. We have sinned when we have been ruled by our anger, when we have held our grudges, when we have not questioned our preconceived notions of who is good and who is bad, when we have been selfish, mean-spirited, short-tempered, or when we have been so certain that we are right that we become quick to speak and slow to listen. The list could go on, but the, the point is clear. Jesus takes all of our sins seriously as well as their consequences and still says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We don't gather this day because we're good people who have made some mistakes and it'll all be okay. That's not why we're here. We're not here because we're, you know, we're just good people and we, we might have messed up, but we're, we're, we'll be fine. We gather this day because we are broken people who have sinned against God and each other, hurt each other in the process, and we gather to accept that we are forgiven, and as forgiven people, we can now live new lives. This day does not work out because we're so wonderful. This day is a celebration because Jesus is good, and he forgives us who are not. And so this day we gather as sinners who are truly forgiven. And that is the good news of this day. If you have sinned, and you have, by word and deed, when you accept that this is the case, and you take our sin as seriously as Jesus did, we are then open to forgiveness, and that forgiveness transforms our lives in this lifetime, and gives us the hope and confidence to face death unafraid, so that we can look towards the kingdom of God and the life that is to come after this. Now this applies as much to me as to any. What Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, he says, I am chief amongst sinners, and I echo that every day. I am chief amongst sinners, forgiven just as you are. And it is Paul who then explains what it means when we make this confession. He writes to the church at Corinth that's kind of struggling to find its way. And he says, this is your gig. This is what you're to focus on. God who reconciled us to himself through Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's your gig. The ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting trespasses against them, and trusting the ministry of reconciliation to us. And so, we are ambassadors of Christ. If you ever wonder what your title is at church, that's, that'd be as good as any. You are an ambassador of Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's what, that is our role here. We are ambassadors of forgiveness and reconciliation. We are sent out from this church, and sometimes I get the sense we're sent out and we get the feeling that we're kind of like salespeople. We're going to go out and we're going to go find great people and tell them how good they are and tell them, you know, come to church and, and this great church and we'll all just be great together and it'll just be wonderful, perfect people getting together to be perfect together. We're trying to sell Jesus. That ain't the truth, is it? And if you've ever thought that is the case, I'm sorry, because here's the real truth. We are ambassadors. We are broken people who are forgiven, who are then sent out as ambassadors of that forgiveness. We are sent out to forgive as Jesus forgives us. If you think about what ambassadors do, right? Ambassadors do three things. They either maintain a relationship that's already good, they rebuild a relationship that's broken, or they build a relationship that's, that doesn't exist at all. And that's what we are sent out to do in the name of Jesus Christ. We are, we are sent out to maintain the relationships between ourselves, to rebuild the relations that are fractured amongst ourselves, and then build new relationships with, pe with people who do not know the, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Jesus talks about this constantly throughout the scripture. In, in the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray in the middle, of the, he says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, right? The, the, the logic there, forgive our, our sins as we go forth to forgive others. Matthew 5, Jesus tells us how to come. If you're going to come to this offering, make an offering, Jesus tells you, if you come to make your offering and you realize that you are sideways with someone else, you have sinned against someone, you leave your offering here and then you go and you get straight with your brother or sister. Then you come back and make your offering. And so if one day the plates are being passed and you realize you've got to run out the door, that's okay. You're doing what Jesus told you. 
go get straight, and then come back and pass the plague, right? Jesus actually gives us very detailed instructions. You are to be ambassadors of reconciliation. In Matthew 18, he says, and this is how you're to do it. If you're offended, you go find the person. You don't wait for them to come to you. You go find that person. And if you can't get straight with them, you go get help. And if you can't get help, then you get a group of people there to help you. And in the Methodist church, that means you call PPR. But that he gives very specific instructions. If you're offended, you get involved. You go seek out the problem. Because that's what an ambassador does. You go find the problem and work on reconciling it. Rebuilding it. And what this, what this leads us to is the, the realization that as followers of Jesus, when it comes to brokenness, we get two options. If you follow Jesus, you have two options when there's conflict. You either forgive and let go, or you forgive and rebuild. That's it. There aren't other options. Forgive and let go, or forgive and rebuild. We don't get to pretend it didn't happen, because it did. We don't get to snipe at each other behind each other's back. That doesn't work, does it? We can't just walk away. That fractures the body of Christ. We forgive and let go, or we forgive and rebuild, because we are ambassadors of the ministry of reconciliation. And so, my friends, I want to leave you with these two most important things from today. If you're looking for the cliff notes of the sermon, here they are. You're a sinner, and Jesus offers you forgiveness. And, and if you don't know that fully, this is a great day to believe it. This is a great day to accept that. This is a great day, whether it's the first time you've heard this or the thousandth time you've heard this. If you need to confess that you are a sinner, accept the forgiveness Jesus offers and be begin to follow him, this is a great day to begin to do so. Come up, let me know at any point from here on out and you will get that taken care of. And if you, have follow, if you have made this decision to follow Jesus, then this is the second thing. For those of us who have decided to follow Jesus, please accept that you are commissioned to be ambassadors. You are sent out of here not as salespeople for Jesus, not as trying to just live in the world, just get by. You are sent out to be ambassadors of reconciliation. You are sent out as princes of peace, as makers of the kingdom of God. And I want to offer you a challenge on how to begin to do that. Can you, between now and next Easter, pick one relationship that's messed up, broken, or just ain't what it should be? And can you work on rebuilding one relationship between now and Easter? Is that possible? I'm, I'm saying one because, you know, this stuff ain't easy, is it? To be an ambassador and rebuild what's broken, that's not, hey, let's sit down and have coffee and it'll all be okay in one, one swing. This is something that takes a while. Ministry of reconciliation. Go forth to do that. My friends, we are forgiven sinners, reconciled to God through Jesus' forgiveness on the cross. As such, we are now sent out as ambassadors of this, going out to forgive and reconcile in a broken world that is in desperate need of such good news. Amen.